something else. Sir. Francisco, já vai começar, vamos lá. Não, 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 a, a aula vai começar, vamos, força. Vocês. Ah, obrigada. Vou da pontualidade brasileira. Tudo bem? Se puder, então deixa aqui mesmo. Obrigada, pessoal. Okay, it's time. So let us start this evening session with uh, Professor Leila Greif, please. Thank you. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank you for the organizers, for the inviting. And I'm going to present a work that I did in collaboration with Robert Brandenberger, Giovanni Marozzi, and Gianpaolo Vaca. The name is Back Reaction of Super Hobo Perturbation Beyond Perturbation Theory. So the aim of our work was to analyze how the cosmological fluctuations affect the background expansion of the universe. So I'm going to begin giving the motivations for our work and then briefly review the dynamics of cosmological perturbations, the ones that I'm going to use. And then I'm going to explain how do we compute the back reaction effect of cosmological fluctuation because the cosmological fluctuations, they affect the background expansion of the universe through what we call back reaction effects of cosmological fluctuations. So I'm going to briefly review how this mechanism works. Then I'm going to give a brief retrospective of what have been done in this topic since 86, because there are lots of, of works concerning the back reaction of cosmological fluctuations. And then I'm going to show how do we calculate the non-perturbative back reaction effect of super hobo fluctuations. I'm going to give the context of our work and then compute the effective expansion rate, first in perturbation theory and then beyond perturbation theory. And then our conclu conclusions. So the questions that we intend to address are how do cosmological fluctuations back react on the ex expansion of the universe? And if these back reaction effects of the super hobo cosmological fluctuations can decrease the effective value of the cosmological constant. Because some previous works have suggested that, that the cosmological fluctuations can affect the background expansion in a way that it could reduce an effective value of the cosmological constant. However, these works have worked in perturbation theory. And whenever this mechanism becomes important enough to decrease the cosmological constant, the perturbation theory is not valid anymore. So you need to go beyond the perturbation theory so to confirm these results. And this is the motivation for our work. And this issue of reducing an effective value of the cosmological constant is related to the cosmological constant problem. The cosmological constant problem arises when you try to couple quantum fields to gravity. So when you try to couple quantum fields to, to gravity, a natural question that arises is, does quantum vacuum energy gravitate? If your answer is yes, then you have to deal with the cosmological constant problem. Just to remind you, the cosmological constant problem is due to the fact that we observe now the universe is accelerating. And the most simple explanation for this acceleration is a cosmological constant. And um, the cosmological constant is natural, also naturally associated to a vacuum energy due to its behavior in Einstein's equations. However, if you compute the vacuum energy from quantum field theory, you will obtain a value that is 120 order of magnitudes bigger than the value inferred from the observations of the accelerated expansion. So this is the cosmological constant problem. So some people may think, if we don't observe such a huge value for the cosmological constant, maybe it's because quantum vacuum energy does not gravitate, right? 
However, if you suppose this, then you have to explain why the almost constant potential energy should then gravitate. Because in the models that people do not suppose the, co the cosmological constant as being responsible for the acceleration, usually they suppose a scalar field with, with an almost constant potential energy that will do this job. Usually it's dark energy, right? However, uh, an almost constant, con constant potential energy behaves much similar to a, to a vacuum energy. So you have to explain why one would gravitate and the other not, right? And however, here in our work, we are going to address this approach and we'll try to reduce the predicted for the cosmological constant, the value predicted by the theory. I think it's better now. So if you look at Friedman's equations, you can see that, just a minute. Okay, in Friedman equations, you can see that if you suppose that the cosmological constant has the small value inferred from the observations, then this, ter this term is, will be completely negligible in the early universe, because in the early universe, the energy densities are very high. So you, you will neglect this. On the other hand, if you suppose that the cosmological constant has the high value predicted by the theory, this term can be important in the early universe also. So a bare cosmological constant could be important in the early universe and could drive an inflationary expansion. So if you have some mechanism that could reduce this cosmological constant value, then the inflationary expansion would then terminate. So if there is some mechanism that acts adding a term to the Friedman equations and it has an equation of, equation of state of a cosmological constant, then we can define a new effective cosmological constant which is given by the constant value plus this function of time given by this mechanism. If this function of time is negative and increasingly negative, then you can reduce the effective value of the cosmological constant. And this is what you're going to check. We want to check if the back reaction effect of cosmological perturbations can be described by such a function and then could decrease the effective value of the cosmological constant. So this issue of terminating the inflationary expansion is related to the problem of the stability of the sitter spacetime. The problem of the stability of the sitter spacetime have been investigated since a long time ago, since 86, and it has been conjectured for some time that the sitter space is unstable due to infrared effects. In these works, they analyze the effect of gravitational production of particles. What happens is that in a desitter phase, your universe is expanding, so your gravitational field is varying in time. This gravitational field varying in time is supplying energy to your quantum fields, like matter and radiation. So you are converting vacuum energy into particles. And they argue that it's hard to define an stable desitter phase in the absence of a minimum vacuum energy where you, where you have... Uh, where you don't have excitation of particles. So it's hard. The curvature is constant, but your, your dynamics of expansion and contraction in an accelerated expansion is it stretches your perturbations mode, right? So you can see that this leads to particle production because when you look at the equation of motion of your perturbation, of your matter fields, you'll see that this effect of expansion of the universe, it acts like an effective term to the mass of the fields. So it's like if the mass of the fields was time dependent. And this can be interpreted as particle being produced in the universe. This is the Parker mechanism that he proposed. And what they say is that this can drive an instability of a desitter spacetime. Doesn't need a static spacetime in the beginning and the end to find actually uh have a well-defined particle number space? Yeah. Actually, you, you work in a semi-adiabatic approximation and you actually compute the number of particle producers in this uh, almost adiabatic moment, right? But you can see that the particle are produced due to the squeezing of the modes, right? Due to this expansion. And in the end, you compute afterwards the number of particle producers. But the point is that this can lead to an instability of the sitter phase. And even today, this topic is, is being much discussed in the context of the swamp plan criteria, and they are seeing that a stable desitter phase seems to be inconsistent with string theory. And also standard inflation is having the same problem. So here, this 
this issue of instability of the sitter space is connected to our work since we intend to analyze the mechanisms to decrease the cosmological constant. So it, it will terminate at the sitter phase, right? So just giving a brief review of the dynamic of cosmological perturbations, usually we consider this form for a metric with linear fluctuations, right? We know that our universe is very homogeneous and isotropic in large scale, so the background quantities can only depend on time coordinates, not on space coordinates. However, your fluctuations will depend on time and space coordinates, right? And in the absence of an isotropic stress, this phi is equal to psi in linear perturbation theory, but not beyond, okay? So Usually, you, you consider fluctuations in metric and in matter, and they are both connected through Einstein's equation, and these quantity are space and time dependent, right? So, here is a sketch of the co-moving Hubble radius and co-moving density perturbation, and you can see that during inflation, your co-moving Hubble radius decreases, while your co-moving density fluctuation remains constant. So, what happens is that as space-time is accelerating and the cosmological fluctuation are being stretched, the modes are exiting the hobo radius. And it happens that the phase space of super hobo modes increase a lot during the inflationary phase. So you have an increasing phase space of infrared modes. And this will be very important for our framework here. After inflation ends during the hot Big Bang explosion, your density fluctuations will go inside the hobo radius again, right? When the fluctuations are, are inside the hobo radius, they oscillate, and when they exit the hobo radius, when they are super hobo, they do not oscillate anymore. They are frozen. We say they are frozen because they do not oscillate, but they keep red shifting with the scale factor, right? So uh, someone may ask me, why is it important to compute the back reaction effect of cosmological fluctuation if we know that the amplitude of these fluctuations are so small, right? How can they be so important? It happens that the power of this feedback comes not from the amplitude of the perturbation, which is always small, but from the fact that the expansion of the universe redshifts the wavelengths of perturbations, causing an exponential growth of population of infrared modes. So this is what makes the effect so important, right? So I'm going to briefly give an idea of how works, how this mechanism works. So we know that in linear perturbation in Fourier space, each mode evolves independently. However, Einstein's equation are highly nonlinear. So if we start with a background solution and then add to it um, small amplitude fluctuations, which satisfies linear perturbation equations, then these equations are not satisfied to quadratic order anymore. And you will see that second order metric and matter perturbation will build up and will induce corrections to your background, right? So even at classical level, fluctuations at second order influences the background. So the usual procedure to compute the back reaction effect consists in, first, you expand Einstein's equations to second order in the perturbations. Then the first order terms will cancel because they satisfy linear perturbation equations. Then what you do, you will take your second order terms, oops, you take your second order terms and pass to the right hand side of the equation. Then you can define a new effective energy momentum tensor, which is the spatial average of your second order terms, both second order in metric and in matter, right? You take a special average of this, then you have a new effective energy momentum tensor, and you add this energy momentum tensor, which is due to your fluctuation you add to the background energy momentum tensor, right? So you can see that your perturbations at second order will influence your background quantity. So it will influence the background expansion of the universe. And then you regard these resulting equations for this effective energy momentum tensor as equations for a new homogeneous metric. So this is basically, in few words, how, how it works. I'm going to give a brief retrospective of some works that have addressed this topic. Of course, I don't intend to cover all literature because there are many, many works about it, but just give some examples. So in 96, uh, they computed the back reaction of super hobo gravitational waves in perturbation theory. 
and they propose that inflation happens for no other reason than that the bare cosmological constant is large and positive, no need for scalar. Since they, since they analyzed the tensor perturbation, they didn't need uh, matter fluctuation to source them, right? And so the, they found that the reason our universe is not inflating today is that infrared process in quantum gravity tend to screen the bare cosmological con constant. So they computed the graviton diagrams and they saw no effect at one loop, but at two loop they found this effect, right? And also in 96 they point out that the most interesting of these effects are not easy to obtain because they occur after perturbation theory has broken down. So in 96 they already pointed out the need to go beyond perturbation theory to confirm this. In 97, how Abram, Brandenberger, and Mukhanov, they computed the back reaction of super hobo cosmological fluctuations, and they found that for long wavelengths, scalar and tensor perturbation, the effective energy density is negative and counteracts any pre-existing cosmological constant. So they found that in the case of scalar perturbation, uh, it induces an effective energy momentum tensor, which acts, uh, the effect is decreasing the cosmological constant value. And in 2000, Brandenberger speculated that this dynamical relaxation mechanism for lambda would be self-regulating because they saw that since it's the super hobo fluctuation who drives this mechanism, whenever uh, the hobo parameter decreases enough, this process will stop, right? Because you don't have any more an increasing of the phase space of super hobo modes. Actually, this is a retrospective, but I don't, I'm not saying that I agree with, with the result or that I agree or that I not agree. The, the point is that some of this work in the retrospectives, afterwards, they proved to be wrong in some aspect or not, right? Okay. But here, uh, they found that in the specific case of scalar perturbation, this effect, we have the question of state of a cosmological constant. So it could reduce the cosmological constant. And they spe he speculated that this could, could be a self-regulating mechanism due to this effect of super hobo fluctuation it stops exist, exiting the horizon, right? Actually, in 98, a big challenge was imposed to these models when Un Hu was analyzing if these effects were really locally measurable or if it was a gauge issue, right? And he argued that this effect is invisible to any local observer and thus does not constitute a relaxation of the cosmological constant in the normal sense of the term. He argued that this effect could be undone by a second order time reparameterization. So it's only a gauge artifact. And it was actually a big challenge imposed to this model at, at that time. However, in 2002, they show that back reaction effect is for real and it's actually a locally measurable quantity. However, not in the case of a single adiabatic fluid. What they found was that if you consider a second fluid, a subdominant fluid, and you associate it to a clock field, <coughs> then you have a clock field tied to an entropy field. In this case, the effect is locally measurable. So it's a physical effect and it's a real effect, right? So in this work, they found that the back reaction slows inflation by an amount which eventually becomes non-perturbatively strong. And in 2005, they showed that infrared back reaction is for real in two matter field models. Also, Unhu itself in 2005 agreed with them and showed that this effect is measurable. In 2030, Maroz, Ivak, and Bramdeberg made the work in which they consider a class of observers associated with a clock field, and they found that the effective expansion rate computed in a gauge invariant way is smaller 
then what will be measured in the absence of fluctuation? Again, they highlight that they are not sure that the results found can be extrapolated to a non-perturbative region. So, in summary, the results so far, since 85, several works indicated a possible instability of the sitter space, and they show that the back-reaction effect of super hobo fluctuation is for real and seems to be able to relax the cosmological constant. All the problems with gauge observables, measurability were all solved. However, all analysis so far were made in perturbation theory. And whenever these effects become important enough to really decrease the cosmological constant, perturbation theory is not valid anymore, right? Because the importance of, of the effect is too big. And in this case, in order to confirm this suspicious, you need to go beyond perturbation theory. So, in order to obtain conclusive results on the effect of back reaction in relaxed the cosmological constant, it's necessary to go beyond perturbative regime. And this is what we did in our work, which was released in Archive today. It's a very recent work. <laughs> so, I did in collaboration with Brandenberger, Marozzi, Ivaka. Marozzi was from CBPF a few time ago. And we showed through a non-perturbative analysis that the measured expansion rate obtains a negative contribution. The absolute value of the contribution increases in time. This is the same effect producing by a decreasing cosmological constant. And this supports the claim that the sitter space-time is unstable and that it will lead to a dynamical relaxation of the cosmological constant. So mainly, we confirmed the previous suspicions. Now, since we computed to a non-perturbative analysis, we can give a more conclusive result about that, and the suspicion was now confirmed. The context of our work is that we suppose a large bare cosmological context, which leads to inflationary expansion in the early universe. We also have a subdominant inflaton field. Actually, the accelerated expansion is driven by the cosmological constant, because the inflaton is subdominant, and it and it is there just to set up cosmological fluctuations, because since we are working with scalar perturbation, you need to have also fluctuations in your matter field, right? So, since, as I told you before, we have an accelerated expansion, so we have an increasing phase space of super hobo modes, right? Once the back reaction effect of these modes has built up sufficiently, it can cancel out the bare cosmological constant and the phase of accelerated expansion can then terminate. So I'm going to briefly introduce our calculation, how we did it. And we suppose a non-perturbative metric, which is actually a generalization of the usual metric in longitudinal gauge. This metric was proposed by Afshorji and Brandenberger in 2001. And you can see that if you suppose that this fluctuations field is small, then you can expand these exponentials and you obtain back the usual metric, right? So this is the metric that we consider. Then we compute the effective expansion rate from the point of view of a clock field, which is a test field. This psi is our clock field. This was computed in previous works also. And actually, you can see that the effective expansion rate is described in terms of this theta, which is the gradient of the normal vector, the normal vector to the constant psi surface, right, to the constant clock field surface. So you insert the gradient of the normal vector here, and you take the spatial average of this quantity in the surface of constant psi. And this was done in previous works also. You can see that the effective expansion rate is written in terms of the metric and the derivative of your clock fields. Then we make a coordinate transformation from the longitudinal gauge to the gauge in which our clock field is constant in space. And we compute the local measure of expansion in this gauge. And this gives us this expression in leading order spatial gradient expansion. Actually, we do an expansion, but it's not an expansion in the amplitude of the fluctuation. It's an expansion in terms of the gradients of the fluctuations. And this is not a problem, because the important modes for us are the super hobo modes, so they are large scale modes. Therefore, it, there is not a problem to make a gradient expansion, right? It's a good approximation in this case. And you can see that the hobo parameter is given by a background term plus this term, which comes from the fluctuations of the metric, right? So it's a function of the time derivative of the fluctuation of the metric 
and the explanation of the fluctuation of the matrix. Then you are going to compute this quantity, firstly in perturbation theory and after in beyond. So um, if we expand that, exp that exponential since the fluctuation is small, in perturbation theory you are supposing that they are small, then you expand the exponential and you have this expression. The linear terms are going to vanish when you take the spatial average and you are left with this quantity here. Then you Fourier expand this field and then you can compute this quantity here, which is given by this integral, where psi k is the amplitude of the modes, right? And you will integrate this in all the super hobo modes. In order to compute this quantity, we have to suppose two conclusions, one for observations and another from theory. We know that observations tell us that the power spectrum of cosmological fluctuations is almost scale invariant, right? So this means that this constant must be, this term must be almost constant. And this give you, gives us psi k, which is given by k to this power, right? Another result that we are going to use is the result of cosmological perturbation theory which tell us that psi k is constant on super hobos k plus a decay mode. Why? Because we know that when the mode exceeds the, the horizon, it, it gets frozen, right? It doesn't oscillate anymore, but it keeps redshifting with the scale factor, right? So you can describe this fluctuation as a constant piece plus a decaying piece, which decays in time. And this decaying piece will, will exponentially decay in time. So you can write it like that. Then you substitute this psi k here, and you derivate this and substitute it in here. After that, you'll be left with this expression, right? Since you are going to integrate in all super hobo modes, it means that the smaller scale mode that you integrate is the one which are just crossing the horizon. So you use the horizon, horizon, horizon no, sorry, hobo radius. It's different from all that. So you use the hobo radius condition and you will obtain the wave number that corresponds to the mode that just exits the horizon and you put it in here. And here is your infrared cutoff for the wave number. After performing this integral, you will obtain this form, right? You'll see that the exponential times the other exponential will give one and you represent this quantity by an f of t function, right? You can see that since this is an infrared cutoff, this quantity is always smaller than one. You can see that f is a positive decreasing function of time, always smaller than one. Then, in conclusion, you have an increasingly negative contribution to the hobo parameter. Now let's go beyond perturbation theory. Beyond perturbation theory, you cannot expand this exponential anymore because you cannot suppose that the fluctuations are unimportant, right? So, however, we can always write your perturbation field as an amplitude, which is time dependent, times a, a function whose spatial average vanishes. And this represents the, oops, this represents the oscillation in space, right? This is a, a function of unit amplitude, and this gives you the amplitude of your fluctuation. So you sp just split the function like that. Now, we are going to make an adiabatic approximation just in the first step of the calculation. After that, I'm going to go beyond that. But in the first moment, let's neglect the fact that new modes cross the hobo horizon. So, hobo rates. <laughs> so let us, uh, for a moment, neglect the fact that your super hobo modes phase space is increasing. If you do this, you can, again, write the, your amplitude as a constant piece time a piece that depends on time and actually it decays on time exponential for the same reason as before, right? And when we do this adiabatic approximation, so we suppose no grow on super Hubble's case, we can write this function g as only a function of space coordinates and not time. So you separate this as a function of time and a function of space only. <laughs> then you derivate this psi, and you obtain this quantity. After substituting in the expression for the Hubble parameter, you will obtain this expression, right? So you can see here that ERG function represents an oscillation. So it has positive contribution and negative contribution. However, 
This exponential term acts like a weighting function, so it gives more power to the negative contribution of d, to the points in which x is negative. Why? Because when x is negative, when g is negative, sorry, this exponential will be bigger than in the case that g is positive, right? It means that the huge contribution to this quantity is given by the values in which g is negative. And from this, you conclude that the expectation value in the numerator is negative. Now, let us consider that the space of super hobo mode is increasing because in acceleration expansion, new modes are constantly exiting the hobo radius, right? In this case, the, the effect of this is that the overall value of A will increase in time, right? Because the effect of the fluctuations will be more and more important with time as modes exit the hobo radius. And this means that the value of A, the complete value of A, will increase in time. So you can see that the absolute value of this quantity will increase in time, since here the main contribution is negative, and this will increase in time. So, really? So you can see that the derivative of this quantity is negative. So these effects give a negative contribution to a hobo parameter and an increasingly negative contribution to the hobo parameter. And this is exactly what we need to relax the cosmological constant and to terminate the inflationary expansion, right? So we basically confirm the previous suspicion now through a non-perturbative analysis. So the expansion rate measured by a clock field obtains a negative contribution from infrared fluctuations whose absolute value increases in time. Now it is confirmed to a non-perturbative analysis. This is the same effect which a decreasing cosmological constant will produce. And since this contribution increases in time, the back correction effect corresponds to an instability of the sitter space and not just to a renormalization of the cosmological constant. So, infrared fluctuations lead to a dynamical realization of the cosmological constant. And now this is confirmed through a non-perturbative analysis. Thank you. But I would expect that uh, if this were a self regulating system, that the correction would decrease so as it will actually go to a constant value that almost right. uh, cancels out the bare proportional constant. Okay. So Not at this effect. point yet. We are previously. So you say that it's negative and it's increasing. So it will reduce. But after that, then it will be self-regulating. I, I still didn't get to that point because the intention was to prove that the contribution was negative, was increasing, increasingly negative, so it will reduce. Okay, so it did the job that we was expecting. And then after that, after reducing the value of the cosmological constant, then it's going to be less and less probably, right? Then it will be a self-regulating mechanism, but this is before that. Okay, oops. No, no, the, the self-regulating mechanism comes from a qualitative argument because you see that uh, super hobo phase space is growing. So at this point, the effect is negative and increasingly negative, right? So at the point that it's increasingly negative, at some point it, it's going to uh, reduce the cosmological constant enough so that, so that you start self-regulating the mechanism since the modes will start not increasing so fast anymore, and after that, stop increasing, and then it's self-regulating after. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a second question? The second question is what, what, what bugs me is that if you have the standard background revolution of uh, the new model broker with the CDM model, then the, the theater space with uh, the cosmological constant is dominated, uh, it acts as an effect for the space space. So if you don't have uh, to to sell, to fine tune the initial conditions. Then the system will go through a subtle point, which corresponds to the matter dominated phase, and then will naturally go to a, to a, towards a deceiver dominated phase, where a cosmological constant dominates. Mm -hmm. So it looks like uh, the deceiver space, which is the attractor, is stable because it's an attractor. You you see my point? 
Um, we're not no. talking about perturbations the, the, here, we're talking about just say, background evolution. When you say unstable, it's not that it's not going to occur, but it's going to end, necessarily, you know? Yeah, but, yeah, that's what I miss. I mean, what's the what's missing when I talk about this background evolution in standard lambda CDM, where the decider phase is an attractor, so it won't end, ever. So, uh, uh, it's uh, stable. But I think that the, the framework that you are mentioned does not take into account this back reaction effect, right? Because otherwise, it, if it take into account this mechanism, it's not going to be stable. And that's the, the yeah, whole thing. Yeah, I, I understand. What I, what I miss to say is, where it, uh, wh how this this framework that I mentioned, where should it, it should be corrected so to take into account? It should be account. corrected by taking into account the back correction of cosmological fluctuations beyond perturbations here, because what you are saying is not taking into account the back correction. No, it's effect. completely homogeneous. Yeah, yeah. That's so right. it should actually, That's right. because it's not a supposition, right? They they must be taken into account. True. Anyway, true. Yeah. Okay. So questions. So I will come back to the first question of him because then uh, the, the Hubble rate is going down, 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 down. But uh, you are postponing for perhaps the next paper to show that then it will stabilize. Yeah, yeah. So this is postponed to the next paper. You, ha you have to show that yet, we right? We show that, we can show that through qualitative arguments as, as Hubble he did in 2000. So from qualitative arguments, you see that yeah. the super Hubble phase space will stop growing. And so this leads to a stop in this mechanism. So from qualitative arguments, we know that this is going to happen, but we don't have this full solution at this point. Yes, you're right. I think perhaps we have to put some time-dependent cosmological constant in in the background equations, perhaps, right, to see if it stabilizes something like this. Yeah, yeah, we need this part of the solution. Yes, maybe in the next work. So you for see, sure. Yeah. I think okay. he for the questions, there were some question. raises hands. I think maybe it falls in the same category of Max works, but as the Hubble radius uh, keeps growing and the phase, the modes that are super Hubble uh, stay, stop expanding after they, they pass the Hubble radius, at some point those modes will be sub Hubble again in the future? Yeah, they get sub Hubble whenever inflation ends and in the radiation phase and matter phase, they grow, they go inside the horizon again. And then they make some effects on the cosmological constant, constant again? That no, may because uh, if they computed this in 97, and the effective energy momentum tensor induced by sub Hubble modes are not the same as a cosmological constant anymore. It has an equation of state, I think, one third, right? W equals to one third, so it does not behave as a cosmological constant anymore. So this effect is just driven by super Hubble modes, because in that slide that I showed the effective energy momentum tensor from fluctuations, this effective energy momentum tensor just have the equation of states of a cosmological constant when the modes, the modes are super hobo, right? Okay, can you? Yes, uh, perhaps, as you said, does it stabilize in uh, lambda very small as today? Do you know uh, about the, that? The qualitative idea is that yes, but, but the uh, qualitatively, of course. But you have to compute this. Uh, yeah, yeah. Any further questions? Also, can thank Leila again. Thank you. So now we have the coffee break and then the, the last session by Ugo, right?